Alito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. I am more than a maker. I'm more than an outdoorsman. More than a protector. Than a graduate. Than a princess. An athlete. A pastor. I'm more than a warrior. Chata Elifi Nachili. Chata Elifi Nachili. I am Choctaw proud. I am Choctaw proud. I am Choctaw proud. We are the Choctaw Nation, and together we're more. Halito listeners. You may recall a former guest of mine in season two, Stephen Oklatubby, the fifth great grandson of the great Choctaw chief, Michelle Tubby. I twisted his arm to come back on the show today because we had to know how his goats, dogs, and chickens were doing. Okay. And of course, to also cover some additional important topics that I think you listeners would be very interested to hear about. So today we'll walk through a variety of topics, such as what it's like to be a mixed blood native, the effects of Jim Crow laws, and how those played into issuing blood quantum. And we'll hear about the stories of one of Stephen's ancestors, Simpson Tubby. Stephen, welcome back. Let's skip the niceties and go straight to the subject of the goats, okay? Okay, this is, I, I hate to start on the downward, on a downer, but Ernie passed away. No. So yeah, he, we had some poultry netting, uh, a fence and I think he stuck his head through to graze and panicked and got tangled up. So that was, that was no good. So Ernie has passed away, but we sent Bert back to his home farm where he was born. And, uh, the farmer has a, has a whole bunch of does that just gave birth. So they're like 20 to 30 little hopping kids. So when they're so weaned, we're going we're gonna to go pick one out to come back with and bring Bert back to the farm. But we didn't okay, want him good. to be alone. So, but yeah, unfortunately that, that happened um, October maybe. And so I blubbered like a baby, you know. I go to I'm about all the to time. cry. I don't like this at all. This is the worst start of Native Chalk Talk <laughs> in the history of episodes. I Listeners, I'm sorry. As you can tell, I'm just hearing this for the first time. All of us are going to mourn little baby Ernie. He was so Le- cute. but He was a good fella. He was Aww. a sweetheart. Um, so if we get a male, we're probably going to name him Ernest. And we're thinking if we get a female, we'll name her Ernestine. So, <laughs> no, know, that's so come, cute. Yeah. I but now, it. so the dogs, we still have the three dogs. Winston okay. is the miniature schnauzer inside. Uh, Sorsha and Chunk are the great Pyrenees outside. And Nia, the cat, is currently rolling around my legs getting her pets right now. <laughs> so we've got, so cute. Uh, we, we've got about, let's see, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 chickens. And let me tell you something, with the price of eggs, I feel like a mafia boss, you know? You, you better guard your land. You know, people are going to come trying to steal those eggs. They're like a hot commodity right now. Well, we've got, I've, I'm sitting on a little over two dozen right now, just of chicken eggs. So you're personally trying to birth these chickens. You're sitting on them. <laughs> Do we need to talk about this? Well, you know, I identify as uh... a chicken, <laughs> a chicken, but no, we also have three runner ducks and the runner ducks are the ones they got the long necks and they just, they, they're flightless. Yeah. Uh, but we had two of the three are Susie's. And so they've been laying eggs. Aww. And by the way, duck eggs are very good. And I've never I had bought, duck, duck eggs. Yeah, they're, they're very good. The yolk is bigger and it's richer, a, a good richer when you eat it. Now we have two African geese, which they're referred to as guard geese. And I ordered two brothers, but, and you'll love this. I named the geese Luther and Vandross, right? Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> but we have we have found out over the past couple of weeks that Luther is actually Lucy. Oh, oh. Now she you know. Has been, 
she has been laying eggs too. And we, we compared the goose egg to the duck eggs and we're like, there's no way the ducks could have spat that out, you know? So yeah, lots of fun <laughs> happenings <laughs> and discoveries here on the homestead. Yeah. It's like old McSteven had a farm. I know it's wild. So fun. And then you've got a little, for, for those who are just listening and not watching, there's a little friend behind you back there on the wall. Oh uh, yeah. Bucky. Oh, Bucky is his name. Okay. Sure. <laughs> how, how many points is he? He is an eight pointer and I, I killed him on my last juvenile hunt. So I was 17. Uh, he has a 21 inch spread. He was a big boy. Yeah. Big boy. And he tasted very nice. How do you get nice. him back? I've never understood how people get their hill back to the house. Uh, well, back in my day, you had to drag it and put it in the pickup truck. Now people have four wheelers, ATVs and all this, but we did yeah. it the old fashioned way. And that is just, thankfully yeah. he has his antlers. So you just, you know, cup his antlers in your arm like this and just yeah. drag. So that's probably why I have a broad back or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Well, something that's interesting in this um, season that we're doing, we're in season four is I'm speaking to a gal who actually kills bears on their reservation and uh, wow. makes bear grease out of it. And that was one of the questions I asked you is, but you'll have to listen to the episode to get the answer you, to how they get a bear back. Did you say they make bear grease? Yes. It's good for your, what? like, you can use it like for lotions. You can cook with it. It's like super healthy. It's okay. pretty interesting. Yeah. I you and I are both learning about that. Yeah. That's new for both of us. So pretty That'll cool but here <laughs> and hearing how she gets it back uh that's also an interesting story in itself so now i know last time we talked you were talking about maybe getting a pet raccoon and an owl did that dream of yours come true <laughs> no <laughs> i have i have turned against coons for a while because oh. i said i've got 11 chickens well i right. had 31 and coons Ooh kind of can't have yeah. them running so, around everywhere yeah okay I had I had to rebuild my whole chicken pen and fortify it you know in so many different ways uh, so yeah, yeah I'm, I would still have one I've got an aunt and uncle that have uh two coons their name the two girls their sisters May May and Rowdy and they're the funnest things we went down for Christmas <laughs> and got pictures and got to play with them um now as far as the owl goes I have I have made a Choctaw discovery regarding owls mm. uh, of course you know eagles and hawks are sacred animals i was talking to owls a choctaw elder death, right yeah oh, i'm yeah, sorry I, I didn't mean to give a spoiler go no, ahead no 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 i was talking to a choctaw elder back in october and i mentioned the word owl so she's about 80 years old so i mentioned owl and she, her face shocked and i said what she said oh she said anytime owl was around it means death and you know I, okay some people would say, oh, Indians, Choctaw, you are superstitious. And like, no, that if if you hear it that way, that you can think that. But the way I understood it, the way she explained it is that, you know, these animals, uh, God or the creator was using to communicate through them to us. And so that when you hear an owl, that's the creator saying that, you know, death is is coming. And now let me just explain this to you. A couple of weeks ago, there was a member of the church where I preach and also a very good friend who was in the hospital after uh, a horrific allergic reaction to die uh, for an MRI. Uh, there are only okay. seven other documented cases of this. So we had arranged a prayer meeting at the school where she was a guidance counselor. And that evening I came home to, uh, to get Stephanie and my wife into change. And when we were walking in the house, there was an owl, not two, not 20 yards from the house. And that thing sounded off. And Whoa. this, this lady passed the very next morning. Well, I, I've got the goosebumps going. Yeah. Oh my gosh, oh, really? Let me tell you one more. We went the next morning after we found mm -hmm. out that she passed, she was only 43. So she was a young lady. Young. Uh, we went to her, her father-in-law's house where her son was and we were talking and he said that the very same night that I heard the owl, he was driving home. And as he pulled onto the driveway to his, to his house, an owl flew across him. So like talk about some eerie stuff. So I, I still like That's, owls, but, but he, my viewpoint has changed. 
No, I get it. So no owl, no raccoons. But wow. you know, I we had uh, friends that they had um, we need the boo we need the poo curtains, and you know how there was an owl. Well, they <laughs> yeah. they took a wide out and they whited out all the owls on their curtains. Oh yeah. Their heads. But well, see, yeah, I, didn't, I, I didn't realize this about Choctaw culture and and owls until I was speaking with this uh, this this elder from uh, the Mississippi band who who was in uh, Nashville and. So yeah, I love talking to her because I'll pick her brain and she'll tell me things and I'll say, I didn't yeah. know that. Well, and so. I think the way she said it was really interesting that owls are not evil. They're just kind of, I hate to say the word omen, but they're they're there to, like what yeah. she was saying, they're there to to send messages. And that's a very interesting way I had not heard it before. Yeah. So so, so her way of explaining it was, you know, that the, you know, creator or God is delivering a message through these animals um you know the owl is letting you know that that death is is upon the doorstep if you will uh, mm -hmm. i forgot what else she she said and, and there are others who may who may be able to elaborate more but i think she said like a hawk means that it means safety you'll be safe uh and an eagle is like a symbol of peace um hmm. and what so so what's so interesting about that is of course, my daughter had been deployed to Kosovo all last year, right. and the week we were supposed to pick her up, there there were hawks all along my drive from the house to town. And then the day before we were to go down to pick her up, there was an eagle in a field feeding off of a deer carcass. So I was like, okay, everything's good. She's going to, you know. So, oh, you well. know, some people look at that and they say, well, that's superstitious. And I always tell folks, I'm not superstitious. I'm a little stitious you know, but not superstitious. Right. Same. Like I don't put stock into everything, but sometimes these little signs come up that you're like, now that that's a little, that's a little crazy. Yeah. Um, or I guess convenient. Um, so, well, thanks for sharing that with us. And for those who may not have listened to your episode in season two, tell us about where you live and about the good work that you do. Well, I live in Murray, Kentucky, which is in uh, Western Kentucky. It's close to land between the lakes. A lot of people know about that area. And I'm the preacher of the Glendale Road Church of Christ in Murray, Kentucky. We've got, uh, I'd say, seven, 800 members of the church. Right. But as with any church, about five to 600 of them show up on any given Sunday. <laughs> Unless it's Easter, Easter and Christmas, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Now, Easter, I'll tell you what, the, the day that we probably have the most is Mother's Day. Oh, nice. I like that. Yeah, real nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, those moms definitely want to come and be with their kids and all that. So, uh, you know, you're Mississippi Choctaw, and you and I once right. spoke about your thoughts on being mixed race, uh, Mississippi Choctaw and Caucasian. And I know we have a lot of listeners who are also in that same boat, mixed of various tribal blood quantum. And like many mixed races, sometimes there can be a push and pull to pick one heritage or the other, or there's pressure to embrace all the realms of your gen genetic makeup, like go all in. And that can even be its own pressure too. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on this subject. So my my surname at birth is Hunter, which is Scottish. And, you know, the, my Scottish uh, heritage is, is very easy to trace. I mean, we've, you know, there's a castle in Ayrshire, Scotland, um, the, the Hunterston castle, and it was Ooh. deeded, I think in the 13th century and the original deed is still on the property and in, encased. So, you know, it's real easy when you have a, a European heritage because you can trace yeah. it. Whereas right. with, with Choctaw, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's oral tradition largely up until a point. So, so I, you know, I'm proud of who I am, proud of where I've come from. You know, I, you look to the past and you go, I'm here because of those who came before me. And a friend of mine asked me a question recently. She said, so I, now some people may think this is offensive, but me and my friends, we speak in insults and roasts and sarcasm to one another. But she asked me, she said, how did you go from kilts to headdresses? You know? And I was like, I said, now I said, I don't have a headdress, but, um, I said, I said, I learned something. Of course, growing up, I always knew I was Choctaw, right? You look at my dad, very dark complected, my mother, very white, you know, you look yep. at my dad's mother, Pogany, 
she very dark complected very dark and yeah yeah you know I, I would go to the res with her when I was a kid during summers and mm -hmm. you know hear her and you know some of our relatives speak Choctaw I had no clue what they were saying you yeah. know I knew a few words you know like a greeting or something like that and thank you you know right so you know I knew it but it's just like yeah it is what I it is what I am and I said now the reason I'm so outspoken about it now is because mm -hmm. I learned that when my grandmother was a girl growing up in Jim Crow Mississippi right right in right. the in the 40s she she faced a lot of racism and I always wondered why didn't she teach my dad my uncle and my aunt more about you know the language or you know the traditions and the customs yeah uh, and I think the reason was is because of the race racism she encountered when you know growing up in Mississippi and so she probably thought by not teaching and passing those things on that it was for their protection yeah for protection I mean it's totally understandable and yours as well yeah and so when I was a kid I would ask her I'd say you know teach me Choctaw and she'd say she'd always laugh she'd say you speak good English you know she said, you don't, she, she would teach me words, but uh, she's like, you speak good English. You don't need to know Choctaw. So, yeah, but it sounds I, you a know, little bit honorary too. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, and here's the thing. So my people are from Pearl River, Mississippi. You know, there are several communities on the reservation. You have Pearl River, Bogchiro, uh, Konahata, uh, various others, Boghoma and Tucker. And there, I'm leaving someone out, I know. Mm -hmm. But now I know, I know a Choctaw elder, uh, she lives in middle Tennessee. She's probably around 80, somewhere in that age range. And I was yeah. talking to her recently and, I, and, you know, she's from Bulk Chido, uh, mm -hmm. and during that time, Bulk Chido was out of all the communities of the reservation, Bulk Chido was the most cautious around white people. Interesting. And she, she told me some stories growing up of her growing up. Cause, cause I asked her, I said, what was it like when you were growing up? And she said that, you know, she and her family were always afraid that white people would come and take her and her oh. siblings from her parents. Oh my gosh. And, and she said at one point, uh, a government officer came to her home and told her parents, you know, you have to put your children in school. If you don't, we're going to take them. And so they found a family that lived close to a school she and her sister stayed with that family during the week. They would walk about two miles to and from school to that, those folks' houses. And then they would go home to stay with their mom and dad on the weekend. Really? Yeah. And she said she didn't know English. She, right. she didn't know English. But when she gets to this school, she's being punished for speaking Choctaw when she doesn't know what English is. Oh. Yeah. So she's, right. she's having to learn a language. And she's also having to not use her own language. And so she was telling me that. And, and because I asked my aunt, I was like, w do you know much about, you know, Pogany's uh, upbringing? And she, she told me, she says she never talked about her childhood. She just and never did. Isn't that so common with, I feel like our generation really faced that with our, especially our great grandparents, some grandparents. Yeah. And it's really sad because we're missing information and we're missing parts of our culture and traditions, but we all totally understand why we get it because they were afraid of the ramifications, even when things were okay and, and things were well somewhat okay and better for our people, it still was a little daunting. So and I think it was, I, I feel like there's this, this pressure to, you know, for some to be more native by diving in a hundred percent to live your culture and traditions or the opposite, stop embracing that side of your heritage because you're not full blood as if you can only practice or understand or, or learn about your culture if you're full blood. And you and I both know this subject can get a little nasty at times too, like native American groups on social media, some of them can have some extremely hateful and judgmental comments, especially for those who are still trying to understand it all. And I'm not a fan of this, not at <clears throat> all. No. I think in life, you know, we humans need to be kind and try to understand where folks are coming from and guide people and help people if they're kind of early on in the journey and they're excited and they're trying to figure it all out. And maybe if we can't be that way, how about we just stay out of it? Personal opinion, 
take it or leave it y'all. But, <laughs> and then not to mention there are the haves and haves nots of CDIB cards. So some American mm. Indians have their certif certificate degree of Indian blood or CDIB cards, which certify your native American blood quantum with a federally recognized tribe. So for those who may be unfamiliar, there are still tribes today who are not federally recognized. And some of them have had their so sovereignty stripped by the government. And then some were never recognized. So I know that may be hard to grasp considering American Indians were the first here in these lands. It's a bit of a slap in the face that the government won't even acknowledge many of those tribes. And okay, but for the tribes that are federally recognized, some American Indians may be full or partial blood from that tribe, but their ancestors were never registered many years back when the roles were opened for them to do so. In fact, some were tricked into not registering. I had one side of my family that was tricked like that. They were told to go to Texas and the land that they would have gotten was stolen. Then my other side did the full registration on the Dawes rolls. So, uh, you know, I am ex an example too of what many people have gone through with that not registering thing. So, or there's some ancestors that may have registered, but maybe the person today doesn't even know that they did. So those individuals mm -hmm. today are unaware that they can be a member of the tribe. So as a result, in those cases, these people don't have their degree of Indian blood certifications. This does not, I need to make this very clear, not to you because you know this, but to some listeners, it, this doesn't make those who aren't registered <clears throat> any less native. They just don't have their CDIBs. So some Native Americans hate the idea of CDIBs claiming it just makes them like cattle, like a number where others take pride yeah. in that tribal membership. And then others feel slighted, feeling like they should belong to the tribe because they're clearly native, but they aren't allowed in. It's it's just, it's a convoluted and difficult topic. Tell me what your thoughts are on the matter. Yeah, it's it's a mixed bag because on the one hand, it's like you want to, and you know, it's because I'm, I don't have a CDIB card because the Mississippi Band of Choctaw, you have to be uh, half or greater in order to be mm -hmm. enrolled. Whereas, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the Choctaw Nation, you just have to prove lineage to someone registered exactly. on the Dolls Rolls. Exactly. So because I'm from the Mississippi band, you know, I actually call, uh, contacted the Choctaw Nation years ago. And because my great, great grandfather, Simpson Tubby, he is on the Dolls Rolls. Oh. And some of his siblings uh, and children, some went to uh, Oklahoma, some stayed mm -hmm. in Mississippi. So th there's a part that's like, you know, I don't need the government validation, no. but there's another part of me that's like, you know, I, I would like to be recognized as a part of my people, you know? So it's really, it's a mixed bag and you have these conflicting emotions about it. You know, uh, a guy that I know, uh, he, uh, I, I'm not sure. And I never ask someone, you know, how much, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, right, some, right. If someone says they're they're Choctaw or whatever, I, I I never go how much, right? Because we never ask white people how white are you, right? We don't we don't it's ask so black, true. It's true. We don't ask black people how black are you or or yeah. Asians. You know, it, it's only it's only indigenous people that when you say I'm Choctaw, uh, what is that? You know, it's a Native American mm -hmm. tribe. Oh, how much are you? Yeah. Does it matter? You know, I mean, right. I, I, I've got a connection. You know, and I've had people ask me, they say, are you going to do one of those DNA tests? I said, no. And they're like, well, right. why not? You may find out more. I'm like, I don't need to find out more. I know who my father is. I know who my grandmother is, mm -hmm. you know, and I've, I've done the research. I know what? my people. So absolutely. And your father looks full blood, looked full blood. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, not that that matters. It's just, you know, it's yeah. kind of an interesting conundrum. So I had a, a question. So Tubby was uh choctaw of oklahoma right so choctaw nation of oklahoma where because of the dawes rolls but you are mrs you're basically concreted in as mississippi choctaw though that's why you can't flip over to oklahoma right when i spoke to someone uh at the choctaw nation they they said that because my father has a cdib card identifying him with the mississippi band that would be my immediate oh. lineage and, and so that's why 
Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you're fine. I was going to say, uh, you know, that's they said that's why they couldn't enroll me with the Choctaw Nation. That makes total sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I got you. Um, but now here's see, here's go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, you go. <laughs> okay. So I I met with my family um, in December before Christmas. One of my cousins flew in from New Mexico. He and his wife and their children. And I'd never met his wife and children because uh, he's been moved away for six, seven years or so. So we're sitting at the table and this is my Choctaw cousin over here. Yeah. And he asked me, he said, Stephen, judging between me and, you know, he pointed to his wife. He said, which of us do you think is a legitimate Choctaw? And I said, well, I know you're not on the tribal role. And I looked over at her. I'm like, are you Choctaw? She was like, yeah. And I was like, I said, you got to be Choctaw Nation because, you know, and I, she looked very white, you know, <laughs> but, right. but she is. And yeah. then she showed me, she showed me a picture of her mother. And when you, I saw that picture of her mother, I'm like, oh yeah, she's Choctaw. So it's funny how when, when you're yeah. not, when you're not full blood, it, 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 it's almost like the genetics fight and, you know, right. because my, my cousin, Matt, he, you know, he would pass as a white man, but now you look at his brother, Brandon, who's the same blood quantum. You like that dude's not white. He is right. very, very right. dark, you know? So yeah. it, it, it's, it's so and, true. It is. And there are some natives and this is not to be stereotypical because not all natives are dark skinned because there are some that are actually very fair complected. Yeah. Most people don't know that. You know, yeah, they think if you're yeah. native, you look just a certain way and that's it. Right. Well, and the question that I've gotten from people and I think they, I, I don't think anyone's meant ill of it, but the, I've had people go, now, what are you? you yeah. Know? And, and so I, I really, I play with them. I'm like, well, what do you think I am? You know, right. and the, <laughs> you know, the the top answers have been, of course, Mexican. Um, That's what I would have thought too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mexican. I've I've been asked if I were Filipino, and mm. on a couple of occasions, I was asked if I was Japanese. Huh. Which so. I mean, I think that that happens with Native Americans sometimes. Anyway, like my mm -hmm. grandpa, you know, he looked he looked Asian to some degree. Of course, he had the really dark skin, black eyes, and black hair, but Yes, I think that's easily that happens. Um, on the other hand, my cousin Ty, he and I are the same exact blood quantum, but he's got the really dark skin, black eyes, black hair. And same with my my aunts and uncles, five kids from the same family, same litter. Um, two of them look very white. The rest of them look full blood. So it's really strange because they're like brother and sister, you know. Well, so now, I think it, I was going to ask, isn't your daughter blonde? Yes, my daughter is blonde. She looks exactly like her dad. So between my sisters and I, all our firstborns are blonde haired with blue eyes. The secondborns, I never had a second child, but my sister's yeah. second children look native. So, you know, black hair, dark eyes. Um, and so it's kind of interesting that you never know because no. don't scientists say that sometimes too, that if you're married to someone that looks opposite of you that the genetics for the first porn sometimes take the the genetics of the the dad um it's mother nature's way of saying that they are the dad or something like that so it's kind of strange but yeah i've heard something about that and if like if you look at you know pictures of my daughter and son you know my daughter looks very much like me mm -hmm. um, my son has uh, more features of my wife's family uh, you know because when my yeah. son was when he was when my daughter was born jet black hair you know mine too yeah which is yeah. weird yeah now my son turned out with blonde hair though bright blonde hair and people would say you know who who has blonde hair and blue eyes in your family well my <laughs> wife's grandmother did and my maternal grandmother did as well yeah. and i yeah. think part of the the whole goal with us talking about this and for non-natives and natives to hear alike is to be sensitive you know because some people there might be a someone who's half of whatever tribe, but they feel judged because they can't find a place for themselves. They're not quite sure where they fit in. And so. Well, and if, at least in my case, because I'm not on the tribal role with the Mississippi Band of Choctaw, and I do look like I'm not a, a, a white person or Caucasian, um, it, it's almost, and, and I've used this phrase, I said, I feel like I'm an Indian without a tribe, you know. 
uh, and you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, I have relatives, uh, that I keep in touch with on social media and, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's a mix of emotions because on yeah. the one hand, you, you know what you are, but you also feel like you're, you're not accepted because mm-hmm. of the blood quantum issue, you know? Right. And, and then on the other, you're, you can be dismissed. So like, when you're talking to people and you, you know, I, I tell people I'm, I'm Choctaw and of course there's the, Oh, well, how much, you know? Um, and then almost kind of dismissively, Oh yeah, well, I'm part whatever. And mm-hmm. you know, I, mm-hmm. I, like there was, there was one time, uh, this lady was walking up to a group that I was talking to a couple people in and she walked up and, one of the ladies said, oh, this is our preacher, Stephen. I want you to meet thus and such. Uh, Stephen is Choctaw. And the lady mm-hmm. said, oh, oh, okay. Well, uh, you know, we're Cherokee. And I'm like, oh, really? She said, yeah, our great grandmother was a Cherokee princess. Oh. They're wrong. They're wrong. <sighs> That's the other side of the story. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, well, anyway so yeah we could go into that rabbit hole for sure and yeah um, there and, were and, no you know, native princesses by the way just for the those who are well listening. and and what i have uncovered in researching is that uh you know when when uh, white men were wearing were marrying cherokee women you know there's a lot of racism and so mm-hmm. there was a there was a phrase i was told there's a phrase in cherokee that could be translated as Cherokee princess. Um, but it was a term of endearment. Like I would mm-hmm. say, my wife is my darling, right? Right. Well, and, and so the white men would say of their wives, oh, she's Cherokee princess. Well, if you're from uh, of European descent, when you think of princess, you think of royalty, royal family, you go, oh, the Cherokee has royal blood, royal family. It's a, you know, right. so you can make right. those connections, but sure. really it was, it was more a term of endearment to stave off the racism and give acceptance because who's not going to, who's going to reject someone that they think is Royal, you know? Right. I know it it would have been more accurate to say she's a daughter of a chief or something like that, or a granddaughter of a chief. But again, this is a different time. Also, everyone makes mistakes when they don't know the whole story and haven't done their research or whatever, or have been guided by someone. And so I know no judgment, we're not looking yeah. for judgment. We're not passing no, judgment. No, but. It, it's just, it's just always, you know, uh, when people go, oh, I'm part this, I, you know, I, I don't mind. That's great. I'm, but, you know, you being part, whatever your tribe is and me being Choctaw may be two totally different things. You yeah. may know, you know, like you may know it because you heard your grandparents talk about it when you were a kid, you never yeah. really knew, you know, you just know I'm part this. Whereas, you know, in, in my place, I've, I've got a father and a, a, a deceased grandmother, and I've heard the language. I, I heard it grow. I was the eldest grandchild, so I, I heard them uh, speak, and I, I've seen our, our relatives on the res. And, you know, so, the, right. you know, it's not to, not to diminish what anyone else is, but it is to say, you know, just because you're something, it doesn't mean that it's the same of what I am you know, because right. I've got more of a, I've got more of a connection to it. Whereas most people, they know they're some native, but they have no connection whatsoever. And that's what's, I really think that's what's sad, you know? And I think that's where some of the frustrations come in those native Americans say social media groups and stuff is someone yeah. pops on and says something that makes it seem like I'm just looking to get something from the tribe so i'm trying to become a member or you know i'm i'm just looking for i don't know to feel like i'm part of something but i have no interest at all in learning about my culture my traditions my ancestry all of that stuff and i think that that's where some people get frustrated so it yeah because i've been on those groups and someone will go hey i know i'm part choctaw how do i sign up to get the free uh, and the money tree, the Choctaw money tree. Where is yeah. this tree? <laughs> well, that's what I want to know. Cause, and, you know, I've given a couple of presentations about uh, our people and, you know, I always start out 
when there's a Q&A, I'll say, you know, contrary to what you believe or whatever's been said, uh, we don't get free money. Right. You know, um, yeah. Th- there are some benefits we get as being tribal members if we are, but as far as, you know, the free money, uh, that's, that's, I don't know who invented that, but that's a, that's a myth. <laughs> Yeah. And there might be some tribes that there are some tribes still out there that have the per caps that, you know, you get yeah. a certain amount of money when you turn 18 or something like that. But most of these larger tribes, like what we're in, what I love is the idea that they give a lot of jobs. So it's kind of that teach a man to fish type of scenario yeah. where they're not just handing you money, they, but they, there are plenty of opportunities for jobs or helping you know how to get a job or mentoring you through those processes. And that's one thing that I do love about Choctaw tribe is, is that idea that we will help you get to where you're trying to go. Um, you know, because our ancestors were denied their culture for so long, I think that's why people like you and I are trying to grab onto our culture even more to honor them and to make sure it doesn't disappear. And you recently wrote a paper titled being denied your culture. Tell us about the premise of that paper. Well, when I was a kid, um, you know, I remember, you know, the little forms you'd fill out like at school or at the doctor's office or anything like that. There are forms that say, okay, uh, your name, your address, your uh, sex and your race. And so I would go, you know, oh, I, well, I know I'm Native American, so I should check that. Mm-hmm. And I was always <laughs> told, I was always told, no, you're white. You need to check that you're Caucasian or white. And so I was like, so it it put the mind or the idea in my mind is like, oh, I am this, but I'm really not. Right. You know, and it's, I didn't realize how growing up, how those sorts of things, it really conditioned your mind to just ignore who you are. Um, Yeah. You know, because, yeah, I I am more uh, Caucasian than I am Choctaw, but I've got a considerable amount of Choctaw in me as well, you know, but it was always the thing of, well, no, you're more of this. So this is what you are. And Mm -hmm. so it's almost like a suppression of, of a part of you. Yeah. Oh, I get what you're saying. And we don't want to carry on that suppression that our ancestors had to deal with. And you talked in the paper, which I thought was interesting about how when you were younger and you'd go to these powwows or you'd go hang out on the reservation that you would see people in their traditional garb or you would see them acting in a way that seemed more European. And you wrote that the Choctaw were among the five civilized tribes um, amenable to the Europeans they encountered. After all, they had grown accustomed to them as far back as the 16th century when Hernando de Soto and the Spanish came to the United States. Chief Tuscaloosa, sorry, Chief Tuscaloosa, named after Tuscaloosa, Alabama, led a war against Soto. The French later came, then the British, and finally the New Republic after the Revolutionary War. Our ancestors were used to playing nice with foreigners, partly because of our hospitable spirit and because we made trade agreements with them. Some would call it assimilation, but I would prefer adaption. Whenever we see someone doing something more efficiently, we learn from them. If we like how they dress, we'll mimic that dress. The Choctaw didn't assimilate so much as they adopted what they wanted while preserving their culture. And I think some may find that statement statement offensive, the whole, they didn't assimilate so much as they adopted what they wanted. But I actually agree with what you're saying. I think what you're saying is there were some unwanted aspects that may have been forced on them. And then there were some things that they purposely wanted to adopt. And I think age and outlook may have had something to do with all of that too, at the time, you know, depending on maybe an elder wouldn't have adopted some of the, um, the prairie looking dresses and would still be wearing buckskin. But little by little people were like, huh, these prairie dresses are pretty comfortable and they're lightweight, (laughs) you know, things like that. So, um, so let's talk about Jim Crow. Why don't you explain Jim Crow to us and share your own thoughts too? So in my research, uh, one of the things that I uncovered, of course, when we think of Jim Crow laws, we think of how it affected people, uh, you know, call them African-American or black. I don't know what, which is the proper uh, way to refer to them. We think about that and how that affected them, but it also uh, affected us as well because it created an even greater divide 
between, you know, you would have thought that Native Americans and uh, Black people would have been allies of, mm -hmm. of some sort because of the prejudice. But now in 19, I think it was in 1927, there was a case that reached the Mississippi Supreme Court. And it was between an Asian man and a white man. And after that case, the ruling was anyone who was not white is considered colored. So, you know, you've got white people and everybody else, blacks, Native Americans, Asians, they're considered colored people. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that eventually translate into? It translates right. in, into all colored people being equally prejudiced against. And so the Choctaw elder that I mentioned, I asked, I asked her uh, pointedly, I said, what was it like when you were growing up, any sort of relation between Choctaw and, and Blacks in Mississippi? She said, we were treated like they were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think of how they were treated in the Jim Crow right? South, that, that gives you an, a, a little bit of an idea as to how uh, many Natives were treated uh, oh, in absolutely. that time period. And, and, the, it, and the it's blood, hard for us to grasp that, you know. It that, is. And the, the whole blood quantum discussion, blood quantum is a result of Jim Crow legislation. So think of it this way. The United States has made treaties with different tribes and nations. And if you really want to keep the conditions of the treaty, how can you do it and keep it at a minimum? Well. Mm. It, it was that at some point agents went throughout Mississippi where the Choctaw were in Mississippi and they were seeking to only enroll full bloods on these roles, you know, right. forget about half blood. And, you know, so you're separating families because you may have a full so blood, true. a full blood woman married to a white man or a black man and have mixed children well, they would only want to acknowledge. So that's how blood quantum was even birthed. And that is invariably just spilled over into the discussion about Native Americans. You know, uh, Black people used to be quantified as well. I don't think they are anymore. I believe the only thing that's quantified by blood are Native Americans, horses, and dogs. I mean, wow. what, that does that, what does that say right. about how we're viewed, you know? I'm, I'm speechless. It's such an interesting point. Well, and, you know, the sad thing is, is it even creates a little bit, not for everyone, uh, but even among Native Americans, it can create a little bit of racism towards those who aren't as Native as they yes. are. Now, I've yes. never experienced that. I've never experienced that. You know, all my relatives, uh, all my Choctaw family are just as loving and accepting as could be, but I've, I've heard stories of others, you know, mm -hmm. uh, being, I've seen it too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's sad, you know? Oh, absolutely. And I think sometimes there are those of us who are mixed that step back a little bit, like maybe we're at a powwow. We don't completely get all in because we don't feel like mm -hmm. we've earned the right to, because our skin's not the same darkness as someone else's and so I don't know what the answer is to that and I think whatever you're feeling is okay you know as long as everybody's respectful to each other I think that that's what's most important so we're going to shift gears a bit and talk about a paper you wrote about your ancestor titled Simpson Tubby a voice for God and his Choctaw people Ovid Vickers the late English instructor from Decatur Mississippi wrote when a list of influential Choctaw people is compiled Simpson Tubby Preacher, teacher, and storyteller will without a question be among them. So you mentioned you're a pastor, and I know that you come from a long line of pastors, correct? Right, right. So Simpson when I Tubby's started, one of those. Yeah. When I started going to, uh, uh, I would call it preacher training school, you know, my, <laughs> you know, Pogany was still alive at the time. And, you know, I let her know what I was doing. And she said, she said, my grandfather was a preacher. And I was like, really? She, I said, what, what was he? A preacher, you know, she said, well, he was Methodist preacher on the reservation. And so I said, well, what's his name? And she said, his name was Simpson Tubby. I'm like, oh, okay. So I just like thought that was kind of cool. Well, yeah. at some point later, I was like, I'm going to Google Choctaw Simpson Tubby. And I did. And there's a lot of information about him. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, he was a well-known guy. He really was. So there was a, 
an anthropologist. His name it was John Swanton. He was one of the first recipients of a PhD in the United States. Uh, and I believe it was Harvard that awarded his degree. So he studied the Southeastern tribes, you know, uh, and he actually studied Choctaw customs. One of his sources for his book uh, was Simpson. And so wow. he featured pretty prominently uh, in that book. And, and so Simpson somewhat said he was a child that, that saw the modern ways, but he also knew the ancestral customs of our people. And he would say, and in the book, you read it, and he would say, you know, our people do this during this, or they used to do this, you know, because wow. it seemed like things evolved. Um, right. Even the, even the Choctaw elder that I've been speaking about and, and that I've spoken with, you know, I asked her about, you know, for example, the corn dance, mm -hmm. you know, of our, of our ancestors. And she said uh, that she doesn't remember much about it when she was a little girl because it was it was highly protected from outsiders and so it was almost to the point of just not being done altogether for fear that outsiders would see it uh and so i asked her about some of the marriage customs you know uh, because i believe i i saw a a, a lecture that um it might have been someone from the choctaw nation from the uh, the historical department gave about marriage customs. And so I was talking about, you know, what I'd learned. And she was like, yeah, we, we didn't used to do that. We used to do this. So I've noticed that a lot of the customs really? have, have sort of evolved with time to some degree. Yeah. Right. But yeah, but yeah, Simpson was a primary source for, uh, John Swanton's, uh, anthropological study of, uh, the custom, the customs and cultures of the Choctaw. I think Which, this is a good book for all of us to go out and get. I've yeah. not read it. It sounds now, really interesting. It was published, I think, in the 1940s, 30s, 40s. Okay. Uh, and you go to Amazon, just type in John, uh, John Swanton and uh, S-W-A-N-T-O-N and Choctaw. And okay. it's, avail it's available uh, on demand. So they, they will print it on demand for you. But oh, cool. if you if you read any book about the Choctaw people, uh, one that's more academic, uh, those kinds of books that are historical and, and uh, uh, maybe even academic, I guarantee you every one of them cite this work in it. I, I've noticed that wow. in the books that I've read and studied. So yeah, Simpson was a source for that. He, uh, his, his upbringing was interesting. He was the eldest of several children. I, I don't know the exact number. I think at one point I got as high as seven. Okay. But being the eldest, uh, you know, he was given to to whiskey, or as as he referred to it, wiki. Okay. <laughs> w h really? I, yeah, wiki. Um, and he play, He was a great stickball player, and he wrote a little autobiography. And I just happened to have the right connections uh, at our local university here at Murray State University, and so. Uh, a lady that worked there was able to get me a copy of his autobiography for uh, interlibrary loan usage purpose. Ah. I had to return it, but you know, there are only a few copies in existence. Don't we so all wish that. we had that access of like, oh, here's my ancestor and here's their autobiography. Yeah. That's and amazing. It's very, it's very small. It's not very long, but it's essentially him talking about his conversion. And so he was on his way to play a stickball game and there was uh, you know, people bet on the stickball games then. And, and he made yeah. a note, I think, in his autobiography. He said, we didn't know gambling till the white man came. And we didn't know drunk uh, drunkenness until the white man came. Um, but anyway, he goes on and he was already plied with wiki. And he was going to the stickball game to play. And he was such a great player. People bet on, uh, on, on his team because of how well he played. And a mailman encountered him en route. And he tells him, he says, you know, he, he tells him about God and Jesus. And he, he, he pleads with him just to, to leave his ways. And so yeah. Simpson, you know, uh, uh, probably a teenager at this point, he becomes very insolent, cursing the guy. And he said, I'll make you a deal. He said, if you won't go to the stickball game, I'll give you a ride on my carriage. And, and this was the mailman, so right? 
This was the mailman, yeah. So he was on That's his so little carriage making deliveries. So Simpson had never ridden the carriage. And so he was like, okay. So he, <laughs> you know, he gets up in the carriage and the, the mailman takes him to his house and he eats uh, dinner with them. And um, then the, the mailman and his family invite him into the, the next room for prayer. And he, he wrote something to the effect of, you know, after they prayed, you know, like his knees gave way, just, it was a religious experience of sorts. His, his knees gave way and he just went down to the ground and he was so conflicted because of how he felt in that moment, but also how this man was regarding him even after he had basically just cursed him out. Wow. So the longer the short was that he remembers that mailman's children, they were putting them to bed. And he remembers how innocent their faces were during that prayer. And so he wrote that he would trust in the children. He would trust in their innocence and purity. And yeah, so and I, some, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, there was a portion of that that I, that I wrote down because I thought it was interesting um, to quote what he had said. The children followed me from the room. Oh, I was sad and lonely. I wanted someone to love me. And I wanted so much one in whom to place my trust. I think that the faces of the children reflecting as they do innocence and purity look very much like the face of God. I had no God in whom to trust. And when I looked into the faces of those innocents, I must have caught a glimpse of Jesus for when I laid my tired body down to rest that night, I was content for, I thought I will trust in the babies tonight. I will trust in the babies tonight. Oh my gosh, that's so sweet and sad because, you know, you wrote that Simpson may have felt unloved because of how child, child children were raised, raised or something like that. Yeah. So in uh, Swanton's book, uh, he, he wrote about a little bit about their upbringing and essentially, at least at that time, Choctaw parents were very hands-off. It mm. was kind of like, you know, uh, you know, you almost in a sense, raise yourself but you're, you're supposed to have guidance from parents. Um, I, let me say this, and, and this is just speaking from my family. You know, my cousin and I, I told that story about we were at, at Christmas and talking. You know, I had another cousin there. So each of the three of siblings, my father, my uncle, and my aunt, there, were, there was a, a child from each there. And we all agreed on one thing, and that is that uh, our parents were, those, our Choctaw parents were pretty much non-existent in our lives. Hmm. Um, it, 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 you know, there, it isn't because of any animosity. It's just, it's a very dysfunctional family. And I've heard from my aunt and my, my, uh, my father just how hands-off uh, their mother was. And then I learned from one of my aunts that my grandmother, Pogany, she was raised by her, two of her aunts, because her father was in prison for murdering a guy and her mother had married someone else and was living, you know, someplace else other than down there. So there right. seems to be a stream of dysfunction in, in my family. Uh, and, and I don't know if that's something that has come down as a result of, of, of this uh, cause I know Simpson, he married many and they had, I think nine children. My great grandfather, Uffel, I remember him from when I was a kid. He only died yeah. in 99. Uh, he was 80 at the time. So I grew up with him. He would come yeah. and visit for, for, uh, periods of time, but he never would speak English. He hmm. refused, he knew how to speak English, but he refused to speak English. Uh, he would only speak Choctaw, um, but Afo uh, was the youngest, next to youngest of nine children. And so I wonder, and, you know, he was, he was brought up by a Methodist preacher. And Interesting. When, you look, when you look at the turn his life took and how hands off he was and absent, I just wonder, you know, these generational things that tend to stick around. And I wondered if, if, if maybe Simpson might not have dealt with that a little bit, maybe maybe the first time he actually felt loved as he said in his own words uh, was when he encountered that mailman and his family. That's so interesting. And, and the words that he said 
were so heart wrenching. There was, you could just tell like he was a lonely person yeah. who was fighting some demons and he comes into this household and is loved. And then he just sees these innocent children. And I think we've all been there at one point or another where we're around people who love us and it just melts us a little bit. And yeah, I, I also do wonder too, when you're talking about the parents not being super hands-on, when I think about going way back, this might be too deep, but in Mississippi, when a lot of people left to um, go to on the trail of tears during the removal mm -hmm. to Indian territory, a lot of people in Mississippi that were Choctaw stayed behind and life was not easy for them. It was also not easy for those who came over to Indian territory. But sometimes I look at what the Mississippi Choctaw went through and it was horrid, the conditions they were put in, the way they were treated like less than filth, the way some of them had to live in the swamps for a while to hide out. Um, because technically the government wanted them to leave the state and wanted them to go to Indian territory and they were unwilling to. So they made their lives a living hell. So I just wonder if some of that trauma passed down and was just, who knows? Again, it's just a theory, but. Yeah. And now uh, there are some families that were better than others. You know, uh, mine was what I just told you. Um, mm -hmm. But now the the Choctaw elder that I've referenced several times, her family seemed to have been very close mm. and and very, you know, functional, whereas right. mine was a place of dysfunction. But yeah, I mean, if you if you've ever seen the movie Mississippi Burning with um, mm -hmm. Gene, oh, what's his name? Hackman. Hackman. Gene Hackman and Willem Dafoe. Uh, the civil rights activists who were murdered were actually dumped around Choctaw land. Hmm. And there, there's a part in that movie where they show the Choctaw. And if you watch that, those scenes where the Choctaw are in them in that movie, Mississippi Burning, you get an idea of just how poorly they were living, even in the 60s. Wow. I need to go watch that again now. I, I, I don't think I ever thought about that back in the day when I was watching that movie. So at what age did Simpson turn his life over to Christ and to pastoring? I believe he was 19 there about there at 19 to 21, somewhere in there. And okay. so he was the first Choctaw to go to college. I think it was, is it Millsap college Okay. there in Mississippi? Um, I, I, that may be right. I'm going off memory, uh, but he went to college and then he had a, a mentor and that mentor uh, eventually recommended him to their conference to be, to be the preacher to the Choctaw. And of course he was, welcomed in and and you know he lived and preached among them his whole life wow so i know that the viewpoint of choctaws towards christianity overall sometimes varied because missionaries were associated sometimes with the white man and the white man with the removal that had happened um which resulted in what we call the trail of tears now how about simpson what was his view on the matter i mean obviously he embraced christianity so mm -hmm. But it's surprising sometimes that some did and some didn't considering what the circumstances were behind Christianity, you know? Well, one of the things that I wondered, I wondered how did, how did his people look at him? Mm -hmm. how, did they, how did they regard him? Because, you know, here we've lost so much already and he's, he's converted to Christianity. You know, I, I yeah. wondered if they saw him as a traitor to his own or not but yeah. from from all indications he seemed to have been a very beloved person and very well respected within the tribe and that that was a nice bridge you know between christianity and um you know the rest of the world it's like christianity the choctaw way because he had a different uh, yeah. he had a viewpoint on the great spirit and the true god as you put it right right his feeling was you know uh, i think what he believed is, you know, great, the great spirit who, who we would call God, he mm -hmm. believed naturally that the great spirit existed, but you just couldn't know him. You couldn't, he was untouchable, but then it's almost like, okay, you can know him through Jesus Christ, his son. And, you know, so yeah. it's kind of like, it's kind of like that foundation was already there to believe, but there was no point of reference. And right. so, when when he is you know when he is uh, uh, evangelized, he he bridges that gap, and you know he 
is faithful till the day he dies as being a preacher and an educator and a voice, you know, for not only for God to his people, um, but, you know, for his people, because he's had opportunities to uh, address Congress when he was alive. And, and, you know, there's one time that he had gone to address Congress and they had, he had set up the first school, the Pearl River School there uh, in, uh, in Mississippi. But he went to Congress another time and he appealed to them uh, that they would, you know, send some people to teach them how to do, you know, more than book learning, but like to farm and, and various things. Because, you know, it, it sounds silly now. It's like, well, he didn't know how to farm. But, you know, it, in his day growing up, uh, women were the one who, who did yeah. that. You right. know, the, really, the, the only men were thing hunting. That the men, hunting, fighting wars, or sitting in council. You know, that's essentially mm -hmm. what the men did. You know, of course, both played stickball, but yeah, uh, yeah, women were vital to Choctaw society before then. To tie all this together, by the way, I wanted to mention something that I hadn't mentioned earlier was that Tubby's great grandfather was Chief Mushala Tubby, right? Yes. So, and I didn't know this. I was reading that book I mentioned by Swanton. Mm -hmm. And in one paragraph on a page, they were discussing a pipe that Mu that Musha Latubby uh, owned, how it was passed down to Alec Tubby, who yeah. then passed it down to Lewis Tubby, who Lewis Tubby being Simpson's father. So that right there, I've got a, a, a genealogy uh, of several generations. And so I was like, wait, I'm, I'm a descendant of that chief, you know? Wow. Um, so I, that was eye-opening, and and that's what ultimately led me to do all that research on. You mean Muscle you're a Choctaw Tubby. Prince? Yeah, <laughs> you're Choctaw Prince. <laughs> I'm I'm more like I'm more like the court <laughs> gesture. <laughs> <laughs> you're the ones they don't come like claim. Just kidding, but yeah. yeah so that yeah. was what we talked about in episode two or, or season two. Um, mm -hmm. back when you were on the show, we talked about Chief Muscle Tubby and and his really interesting story you don't have to go into all the details but feel free to just share a little bit about him since we're on the topic yeah so uh mushala tubby he we know he he was a polygamist he had more than, wait is that, that's multiple marriages right polygamy right yeah yeah okay <laughs> sorry I that. I was did you saying... ever watch the marx brothers they're talking about polygamy and he's like he goes that's bigamy you know bigamy and he's like <laughs> No, that's big of you. That's big of me. That's big of all of us. I can't help but say that joke. I don't know why it came to mind. Okay, let's go back to okay. the serious subject of polygamy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's say it this way. Mushala Tubby didn't just have one wife. He he had at least two that I've been able to read about. So I'm assuming because you know he went on the Trail of Tears to Indian to, uh, Indian country or territory, and mm -hmm. so his descendants out there go by the surname King. Oh, okay. So if, if you know any Choctaw out in Choctaw Nation that are kings, oh, they probably yeah. descend. Yeah. They, My they cousins from... are king. That, that, well. Like, I don't relate to the kings, but my cousins oh, do. Oh, I got gotcha. you. So, yeah. I, if, so uh, that's. Anyway, yeah. No, you're fine. So that's the surname they adopted out there. Now, I'm guessing maybe some of his descendants that stayed in Mississippi, they just chose to take. Uh, you know, Tubby, T-U-B-B-E-E -E is how it was spelled. Um, mm -hmm. Now, my grandmother and her father spelled it T-U-B-B-Y, but Simpson on the Dolls Rolls is T-U-B-B-E-E. -E -E. And for those who, I, I used to always wonder when I was a kid, what kind of a friggin' Indian name is Tubby? You know, right. I'm like, were we all just fat? But what oh, I- Oh, <laughs> you were thinking you know, Tubby. Yeah. yeah, hey Tubby, hey Tubby. But what I found out, <laughs> is that in Choctaw, mm -hmm. Tabi, uh, you, you trace the spelling back, it's T-A-B-I. Uh, Tabi means to kill. And, and warrior, Musa, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost like a rank. Yeah. You know, it's like being a samurai, except in Choctaw terms. So, right. So Tubby was, it was a name as much as, as it was a status. So mm -hmm. Mushala Tubby, uh, I believe his name is translated as determined to kill. And he received that name when he was a war chief leading raids against the Osage. Oh, wow. Yeah. So when yeah. his, it's either his father or his uncle 
Homastabi, who was a chief alongside uh, Apunksha Nubi and Pushmataha. When Homastabi dies, Mushalatabi takes his place as one of the three principal chiefs in uh, the Choctaw Nation before Indian removal. And, you know, he, uh, let's see, there were, I can't remember how many clans, but he was of the Ogla Falaya clan, which, is, which means long people. And I think it was because he was six foot tall. So that's why long people, you know. Um, wow. And so he was chief of that district and, you know, uh, was known as a great orator uh, among the Choctaw, you know but also a very trusted, uh, very trusted chief. Of course, when he, he was one of the signatures of the Dancing Rabbit Creek Treaty, which sadly sealed the fate of our ancestors and ensured that they would remove to Indian territory. And everyone became angry at him because of that, because he signed it. And so, you know, he stepped aside as chief. And David Folsom, who I believe was his nephew, became chief in his place. So that when they traveled, that trail of tears uh he went not as a leader but now as a follower but when they get the indian territory i believe he is made chief once hmm. they get there uh but yeah. sadly he he passed away of what i call the white man sickness you know i think it was some kind of pox mm -hmm. uh you know in in the 1838 i believe it was if memory serves correct yeah, thank you for sharing that because he he really was a one of those chiefs that we always talk about that's kind of on the cusp of the old culture going over to the new the new ways and having to go over on the removal to through the trail of tears and how that would not be a fun decision for anyone. He almost you almost can't win in a situation like that. So yeah. So we were talking earlier about racism against the Choctaw going way back. Um, they were even seen in the 1800s as being even lower than slaves, according to your paper. But it seems that there was somewhat of a change in viewpoint, or at least to some degree, when it came to the U.S. government needing the Choctaws in the Civil War. How so? So the way that it was, you know, a lot of the Mississippi, uh, a lot of the Mississippi politicians, before the Civil War, they were, they were, still so upset that these brown people were still here. They should have been gone. Mm -hmm. Jefferson Davis, who was actually a state senator uh, for Mississippi, he was working on legislation to have the rest of them forcibly removed. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, things got interrupted when, you know, the United States goes to war against itself. And so they go to the Choctaw, who were known for bravery as warriors, and they say, they're going to take this land from us if we don't fight them. Now, what had happened just a few decades earlier? That land was taken from our people. And mm -hmm. so they're the Choctaw are probably thinking, yeah, we're not going to lose it again. And so they, they fight with the Confederacy. And there are, there are writings, diaries about how brave they were in battle with the Confederacy. You know, and I like to point that out because not everyone who fought for the Confederacy did it to preserve slavery. Um, right. You know, there. You know, the politicians and the higher ups they did, but a lot of the the soldiers who were on the front lines they weren't fighting to preserve slaves. They didn't even have slaves. The way that it was sold to them was, you know, they're trying to take our liberty. Well, if someone tries to take your liberty, what are you going to do? You're going to fight. And mm -hmm. so they fought alongside the Confederacy and were notorious for their bravery uh, in, in battle. And so after the Civil War and the Reconstruction era, they, they were not seen as equals, but they were seen in a little bit more of a positive light because of their service during the Civil War. Gotcha. So it's like, well, we need you, so come on over. And then, of course, Andrew Jackson came along and basically destroyed that relationship from there on out so turned his back on him and all that so i digress so yeah. it's <laughs> it sounds too from your paper side note that he was really into education and he even went to college as well right 
Right. Yeah. Simpson, um, my great, great grandfather, I know we've talked a lot of names. People are listening going now, wait, which one is that? Which, yeah, is, which you know, <laughs> who, what? So Simpson was my great, great grandfather. Uh, he, he actually was instrumental in opening the first school on the reservation. It was, it was called the Pearl river Indian school. And, uh, he was a teacher there. He actually, led the farm bureau chapter out of the school and so yeah he was big on education um and and you know i think that was something that even mushala tubby wanted choctaw educated he didn't want mm-hmm. them proselytized or, or that is he didn't want them taught christianity he wanted to learn to think like the white man thought so that they could understand how to uh, they could understand how the white men thought so that they wouldn't have to give any more land away but mm, for simpson right. it was it, it was something different because you know uh sharecroppers and the conditions that they lived in you know he wanted the education to elevate his people right uh we've they've already lost so much so okay let's let's try somehow to 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 elevate ourselves in this world we live in and mm. you know not have such horrible conditions Right. And I feel like that was one of the things that probably was a catalyst, correct me if I'm wrong, for him also helping his own people along the lines of politics, too. Right. Because he, yeah. he understood things better. He did. And he was a great mediator. Uh, well, let me refer. He was a great liaison. He could he was good for his people, but he could also serve as as that man standing in the gap for his people to state government officials, to federal government officials and the like. So mm-hmm. he was, he was, uh, I think just kind of in a unique place for his time. Definitely. I, yeah. The more I've read about him in your paper, the more it, it's super interesting. So I wanted to mention a few of the results that you mentioned of Simpson's advocacy for the Choctaw. Congress opened an Indian agency in 1918. Subsequently, the Pearl River Indian School was built in 1920 and opened near Blackjack. Simpson emceed an event of the school in 1921, inviting the Neshoba Democrat to the occasion. Several state and federal representatives were on hand, many of whom waxed eloquent at the government's achievement. However, the entire purpose of the gathering was for Choctaws to thank Mingo Chito, Big Chief, which was what they called the United States government. Simpson lived and taught at the Pearl River Indian School from 1920 onward and ran the local Farm Bureau chapter out of the school. The Pearl River Indian School was a boarding school to be sure, but run by Choctaws and overseen by the Office of Indian Affairs that had a local agency. So let's talk a bit about the Great Depression and how Simpson was once again helping his people in Mississippi. Yeah, the Great Depression, I mean, of course, everybody had it rough. Uh, Mm -hmm. during that period. Uh, Thankfully, though, uh, FDR signed the Indian Reorganization Act, IRA, uh, and and that that was good uh, in so many ways because up to that point, I think the goal had been forced assimilation of Native Americans, whereas now this allows for a a greater preservation of, of ancestral ways and customs. Mm-hmm. And so that that really that really was was a good step. It didn't go far enough because you know uh, some things appear like mere gestures, uh-huh. and those who are to implement them know how to exploit it as well. So you, you have a little bit of that going on uh, with with funds and things like that from certain agents, and you know just because someone was an agent for the Bureau of Indian Affairs with a tribe it doesn't mean that they actually cared about their well-being and best interest but fdr did a good thing in in signing that ira uh so that you know there would be some greater opportunities and as a matter of fact i think the result of that for mississippi for the mississippi ban it wouldn't be realized for another decade uh after that act was signed but then you have uh roads being built through the reservation i think a railroad was built as well and then you have a timber industry that begins and so that that is only going to do good things for the for the people there absolutely sounds like he was um such a great advocate as you mentioned almost like almost like a chief in a way but 
it but it sounds like Simpson's his great grandfather Mushala Tubby, as we talked about, he wanted him to become chief, but then his conversion to Christianity may have affected that outcome, right? Yeah, in the book that Swanton wrote, um, there's a line there that uh, uh, you know. Now, it, when you look at the 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 time difference, you know, Mushala Tubby died in 1838, and Simpson was born in 1867. Okay, so. I've, I've, but there's a line in there where Swanton says that Mushala Tubby, uh, or rather that Simpson was marked by his great grandfather uh, to become chief one day. Well, you know, by the time Mushala Tubby died, he never envisioned, you know, Simpson being born. So I wonder how that worked out. But yeah, Simpson, given that narrative, and maybe they got the relation wrong, maybe it was an uncle or something. But yeah, Simpson was supposed to become a chief, but it says in Swanton's book that when he converted to the white man's religion, you know, that kind of right. put the kibosh <laughs> on that idea. Wow, interesting. But he really well, did kind of like a servant leadership type of attitude. He was he was a, a teacher, a pastor, all of these things. And he really led in a way that was very humble and he didn't need to be chief to do all of that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, ever since uh, our ancestors went on the Trail of Tears, there was not a formal council slash chief in Mississippi is actually forbidden by Mississippi law uh, up until, you know, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw were actually constituted. Right. Right. Crazy, huh? Yeah. So um, Simpson Tubby. He died in 1943, and that timing was ironic, right? Yeah, it was. So my grandmother was born in 41, mm -hmm. and Simpson dies in 43, and I believe it's in 45 that the Mississippi Band of Choctaw is given federal recognition. Wow. So close. Yeah. yeah. I know. Surely, so close. A lot of those things, though, he did really contributed to some of that, I would think. He oh, kept yeah. them in the forefront. Well, he was going to Congress. He was doing all those things. He was. And there were others who would later come and build upon that. Uh, if you talk to any Mississippi Choctaw and ask them if they know who Philip Martin is, you know, he was a chief for a long time over the yeah. Mississippi band. And he did a lot to he did a lot of good for the for the Mississippi band of Choctaw. He brought in industry. He created jobs, you know, he did so much good, uh, but he and Emmett York uh, did a lot of advocating for Mississippi Choctaw during the civil rights era. So, you know, Simpson is one contributor in a history. Mm. And I think, his, I think his life really gives, it gives me a great lesson. The lesson is you don't have to have a position or a title to do good. Right. Wherever you are and whatever gifts you have, use that to help people. I love that. Well yeah. said. You know, that's a great wrap up for today too. Our, our time has really been interesting today. Thanks for sharing with us, not just about the goats and poor Ernie, but also about those real and raw thoughts about blood quantum and CDIBs and struggles your Mississippi Choctaw faced and the great impact that Simpson Tubby had on his people. So yeah. do you have any parting words for us today, Stephen? The one thing that, that I would love to say just in closing, um, you know, because I'm not full-blooded Choctaw, as you as well, Rachel, you're, you're there with me. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are probably some listeners who find themselves in the same position and they have some of the same struggles emotionally and mentally. Uh, you know, I, I just want to say, you know who you are. Do your best to learn about your people, about your culture, you know, and like I said, we use phrases at my house just to keep somewhat of that Choctaw alive. And, you know, if and when <laughs> my wife and I become grandparents, you know, mm -hmm. I will be awful and she will be Pogany. Uh, we're going to preserve our culture. And so be proud of who you are. And, you know, whenever those intrusive thoughts come in, just tell them to go away. I love that. Thank you. Those are great words. And I guess we shall see you next time, my friend, and tell your family hello. I love your family. They're all so sweet. Um, and I really appreciate your time today, Yakuki. Yakuki. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. 
Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native, C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends.